So, today we're going to cover more JavaScript. Um, we've seen a couple examples um, that involves manipulating the page and taking and either changing content or changing the visibility of content. And we did that to make the menus appear. We also did that to swap images when you moused over a thumbnail. Uh, what we're going to do now is we're going to look at JavaScript and forms. All right. Here's my plan today. I'm going to cover a few more JavaScript examples. Uh, I believe Wednesday will be a day that will work exclusively in the lab. It will be an opportunity for you to finish up your last assignments because you have a few things to do. You have, well, the last assignment. You also have uh, your portfolio and you have the final project coming up due within the next little over a week. So I want to give you an opportunity to answer, uh, to ask any questions you have and, and I can answer them. So next uh, Wednesday, this Wednesday, we will just work in the lab. So this will be the last lecture. At any rate, we had talked about HTML5 form controls. And we said that there are some cool things in HTML5 forms that you can do. But the problem is, is they don't work everywhere. They don't work on every browser. If we go back and look at one of our form examples, take the search example. that if we don't put anything in and hit submit, well, we actually get an error. I mean, it doesn't show up as an error, but the proper results don't occur. We don't see a little message popping up saying, hey, you forgot to enter something in. Whereas if we do put a value in and we submit, we do see the results we want. So in cases like this, oftentimes the way to handle it is to put JavaScript validation to make sure that they've entered something in there. Now we've seen with HTML5 that you can make a field required. But not all browsers support that. And therefore, it's a good idea to add JavaScript in there, too. So you can put required on here, and that will work. and you get that message. That doesn't work on every browser. All right. If we were to open this up, for example, in the old version of Internet Explorer that we have, 
Oh, it does work. At any rate, trust me that there are versions of, the br of browsers that that would not work under. All right. In addition, we could be verifying other things beyond being required. We could ver validate that there, there's at least three characters in the thing that we're searching for. Yes? Um, I think there are um, sites where you can check the versions before the client um, specific code and stuff like that. Yeah. Oh, there's a lot of things that you can do script-wise as far as that goes. Absolutely. Um, what we're going to do, though, is we're just going to say, well, you know, this is well and good, but we're going to go and we're going to validate it by hand so that we learn how to do that. And again, um, <clears throat> we can put validation in for other things other than just required. You know, maybe we want to limit searches to where you can't just search for one letter. Maybe you have to put in at least two letters or at least three letters or something like that. <clears throat> so what we're going to do is we are going to put in uh, code to verify that this field is entered. So I'm going to do a couple of things uh, in preparation for that. One thing I'm going to do is I'm going to assign this guy an ID. So I give it a name and an ID. And again, they don't have to be the same, but oftentimes you keep them the same just so that it's not quite as confusing. I'm going to put on submit on the form tag. All right. You actually could put it on click on the button, but it's better to put on submit on the form tag because there's sometimes ways to submit not clicking the button. All right. You can make enter sometimes allow. If you hit the if you hit the enter key, you can make the enter key submit the form. So any way this form gets submitted, we want to do this validation. Now, this is going to be a little different than we did before, because I'm going to say return on submit return validate form. Now, validate form is a function that I'm going to write. All right, I'm going to put it up in the head. And I'm going to create a function called validate form. It's going to be in a script tag. It could also be in an, in an external file. What does the return mean now? The return is sort of the answer to the function. Functions can return a value. We talked before how functions can optionally have parameters. All right, so we could give parameters to this function. Optionally, we can return values as well. And in this case, we're going to return a value that's either going to be true or false. True indicates that the form is valid, that the data is OK, that you can go ahead and submit the data. False indicates that there's a problem with the data, and we can't submit it to the server. All right. So return, validate return form. This function is going to return a true or false. Return is going to pass that value to the onSubmit event. And if the onSubmit event gets a value of false, then the submit is canceled, and it won't send it to the server. So by putting in return validate form, it's not going to send the data to the server if this guy returns a false. If this guy returns a true, then everything's OK. It will go and submit it. Let me show you this. I'm just going to put return true here. So I'm going to call this function. The function is going to give an answer of true. When you see return, that means this is my answer. I'm going to take that answer and return it to the onSubmit event. And if it gets a true, 
it's OK. It's going to continue and submit the form data. So if I put this in here, then I type something in. And then the submit happens. If I change this to return a false, then this function, the answer to this function, is going to be false. And that's going to pass it to the on submit event, and the false value is going to cancel it out. So we save that. I type in HTML, hit submit, it doesn't send it to the server. So that's how you control whether it sends it to the server or not, through the return value of the function. Again, the return value of the function, think of that as being the answer of the function. Is the form valid? No. And because the form is not valid, when that value gets returned to the on submit event, the submit gets canceled. Well, we don't always want to return true. We don't always want to return false. Instead, we want to look to see, is there something in the form? And if there's something in the form, we're going to return true. Otherwise, we're going to return false. So I'm going to look at the thing on the form that has an ID of Q. How do we do that? I say if document. Document means it's somewhere on the web page. Get element by ID. And what's the ID? Q. If the value of that text box is equal to an empty string, Notice there's nothing in it, then there's nothing to be, there's nothing entered, I'm going to set the return value to false. And then we're going to return the return value. Otherwise, I'm going to set the return value to true. Now, you could write this a bunch of different ways. So if you know a different way to write it, that's fine. But let's analyze what's going to happen here. The browser is going to, when they call validate form, when I press the submit button and when the form gets submitted, it's going to call this function validate form. It's going to look to see if the value of the thing on the page that has an ID of Q, and that is that text box, is equal to nothing, an empty string. If that is true, then the form is not valid. So I make the return value false. Otherwise, I make the return value true. And in either case, when I'm done, I return the return value. So an if statement is like a branching statement. It allows the, the computer to choose between two options. This is what you do if there's nothing in the form field. This is what you do if there's something in the form field. OK? So if we go and run this, nothing in the form field. We press submit, nothing happens. If there's something in the form field and we press submit, it gets sent to the server. Now, something in the form field gets sent to the server. Nothing in the form field 
doesn't get sent to the server. Now, it would be nice to tell the user what happened. Because if you press the button and absolutely nothing happens, you're not giving any feedback to the user as to what's wrong. So what we can do is we can display a mes message. And we can display a message a couple different ways. I'm going to show you the simplest way, and then we're going to do a better way. All right? The simplest way to do it is with an alert bo box. And the alert box can say something like must enter a value. And what that will do is that will pop up a window. And it's called a modal window, which means that the user can't do anything until they've clicked OK on it. All right? So. I click Submit, it pops up saying must enter a value. So at least the user knows what's going on if they don't enter anything in. If they enter something in, then it does go to the server. So that's nice. It's quick and dirty, as we say. It doesn't take a lot to do. But it isn't really effective, and it really gets bad if you have a bunch of things on the form. If you had five or six items on the form, because remember, they could be making, they could omit two required items, they could omit five required items. You never know in a form how many things people omitted. So what do you do? Do you put up a message box for each one of the forms that they've missed, each one of the form fields that they've missed? Then you're displaying a whole bunch of boxes they have to hit enter to go through. Or do you put up a box that shows all the mistakes they've made? That's also not good, because then if they've made a lot of mistakes, they have to remember all the things that they made, because as soon as you click OK, the thing goes away. So we're going we're gonna to show that there's an error a different way. All right? And I'm going to add on the page, after the input section, I'm going to add a span. And I'm going to give it a ID of Q error. Now, we haven't talked about spans before. A span is an inline tag that simply allows us to give to define a section of the page, all right? And we can put messages in there or whatever. Most often, spans are used for displaying messages. Pardon me? OK. So yeah, the spans are used to display message. So what I can do is instead of displaying an alert box, I can put some text into that span. How do I do that? I can do that this way. Document get element by ID, Q error, and I can say inner HTML equals, and I can put some text in there. I'll just put a message that says, must enter something. And now, when I do that, they don't enter anything in, the message appears that you must enter something. Now, we can make it stand out even more by putting in a style for that span. So I could put in style could put in 
a class called dot error where maybe I make the text red and how do we make italics? Never remember. So we'll look. Font style italic. And then I can give the class to that text, all right, that span. Because if there's nothing in it, it doesn't matter what style we make it, right? It's not going to show up red or in italics if there's no text in it. It will only show up red in italics if there is some text in it. So I'll go in here. If I hit submit, it displays must enter something. If I put something in, well, it submits it to the server. Okay. Now, the other thing that we could do, and we probably should do, is we can have a label. We've talked about labels before. And I could really make the label change the style of the label if there was an error. Remember, we use a label for assistive technology so that we can associate the text with the form control. So I'm going to create a label for this. enter a little bit of style for this by doing this form properly. And what I can do is, if there's an error, I can set the style to that error or that. So I can say document Q error, or actually Q label. class name equals error. So if there is nothing in that, it's going to make this and the error message have that special style. And I'm going to say UL 
list style type none. So now if there's nothing in there, notice it turns that the different color and displays the error message. Whereas if there's something in there, it submits it. Now the one thing that you would want to do is if there's not a problem with this, you would reset those back. Because there could be a half dozen or 10 or 15 uh, fields on the page. And if there's not an error this time, there might have been an error last time. So you want to clear out all those error messages. So you do something like this. Would also go and would initialize the return value to true. And if it found an error, we would set it to false. I don't know if you notice, very quickly you can see it clear out. Um, and again, that's useful if you have more than one form field. Questions about this? Now one thing that you might notice is if I put in a bunch of spaces, it counts it as illegal. Because I'm literally testing to see if it is equal to an empty string. In JavaScript, there is a command called trim. And what it will do is it will get, away, get rid of everything before and after the characters. So what I probably really want to have here is I want to say if dot trim. Because that will return any beginning and ending spaces. So if I put spaces in here, it's going to treat it as though it's empty and validate it. Questions? We can also <coughs> use JavaScript and forms to do simple calculations that don't require a server. So let's say, for example, we wanted to enter in the diameter of, or the radius of a circle, and we want to get its circumference. All right? And how do you calculate it? It's 2 times pi times the radius. So let's write a little JavaScript routine to do that. We could do that on the client because it's really not that, it's really not that uh, intensive of a calculation. It doesn't require database interactivity or anything like that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to change this form a little bit. And since I don't want this form submitting to any other page, I'm going to say action pound sign. But I'm going to make this just a regular button instead of a submit button. Remember I said that a regular button is used just to invoke some JavaScript. And I'm going to call this results. And I'm going to change this to be radius.
And I'm going to change this to say on click. I'm going to call calculate, a calculate function. Okay. So in my calculate function, I'm going to say that radius equals document get element by ID radius dot value. I'm going to say circumference equals 2 times 3.14 times radius. And I'm going to set the results. that the inner HTML equal to circumference is, and I'm going to add on the circumference. Okay, so similar to before, I change that from a button or submit button to a button because I don't want to send it to the server. The client side code is going to do the calculation because this is a simple enough calculation where it can do it. So when I press it, I'm going to call the, the function calculate. The calculate is going to get the radius from the form using the ID. It's going to do the calculation and it's going to put in the thing called results. It's going to set the inner HTML to be circumference is along with the calculated value. So, the radius is 2, the circumference is 12.56. I think that's right. All right? Because <laughs> 2 times, 2 times 3.14 is uh, 6.28. If I multiply that by 2, I get 12.56. Now, if I enter something in that isn't a number, I get something called NAN. JavaScript is interesting in that it is called dynamically typed. How many of you have done C-sharp coding? All right. In C-sharp coding, when you declare a variable, typically you declare a type associated with it. You say it's a double or an integer or whatever, and that's what it is. And it always stays that. JavaScript sort of figures out what something is based on how you use it. All right? So <coughs> if I use something as a number, it's going to treat it like a number. If it turns out not to be a number, it just gives you that weird NAN value. So what I can do is I can actually have an if statement here that said if is NAN radius I can display must enter 
a number. Because again, NAN would be confusing for a user to see that. They don't really know what that means. Okay. Actually, it interprets the space as, as a number. So we have to put a catch in there and say, if it's not a number or which is the two vertical lines. Well, it, it would. I just didn't use the trim. So, or trim radius. Because there's two things that indicates it's not a number. Either there's something in it that's not a number, or there's nothing in it. So. That would be the proper test then. So if there's nothing in it, oops, no, it's radius.trim. Or if I put garbage in here. Now how did I know that that was bad? If I said trim radius, I think that's the PHP command. How did I know that was wrong? I would have known if I hit that, gone to more tools, developers tools, and look at the console. And it would tell me, hey, it doesn't know what trim is. Now, that's where you have to do a little interpretation. It does know what trim is, but that's not the syntax. The syntax would be radius.trim. So now we've handled both the conditions and we'll catch if there's nothing in there, we'll catch if there's garbage in there, and we'll catch if you put in the right value. Okay, for your JavaScript assignment, just take one of the examples that I've done in class and just adapt it to, to, uh, to use that, to, to one, of your, one of your pages to, to do that. Okay, I'm going to post this up to Canvas. Uh, then I'll be up to unlock the room. Remember that Wednesday we are going to meet in lab. That's sort of your last day to work on your project uh, in lab. Um, you do have until, I think, Wednesday the following week, or maybe Tuesday the following week. I don't remember. But um, take a look at the announcement about the end of the semester. Uh, this Wednesday we'll be in lab. Okay, we'll see you up there. Starting at 9, yes. All right, we'll see you up there.